Joshua's long day solved. Well, there's a recent article in Astronomy and Geophysics that argues that Joshua's long day was caused by an eclipse of the sun in, two, in 1207 BC. Um, interestingly, the article itself uses the term BC and not BCE. One can ask why that is. It goes on to argue that this dates the reign of Ramesses the Great, Ramesses II, Ozymandias, in uh, Shelley's famous poem. The rationale for this date is presented and evaluated, and uh, I think you will see articles like this periodically, and it is worthwhile to have an appropriate approach in general, and so the specific may, may help with that, I think. The article in question is Humphreys and Waddington, Solar Eclipse of 1207 BC Helps to Date Pharaohs. And um, it is available online. It starts out a puzzling event in the Bible. That's an interesting way of uh, art, uh, italicizing it. I suppose that since they're quoting a book, they have to italicize it just like any other book. Uh, that mentions both the moon and the sun can be interpreted as describing a solar eclipse. We da we've dated it to 30 October 1207 BC. Note that that's not the conventional archaeological stuff anymore. It usually is BCE and CE. Uh, making it possibly the oldest datable solar eclipse recorded. This enables us to refine the dates of certain Egyptian pharaohs, including Ramesses the Great. It also suggests that the expression currently used for calculating changes in the Earth's rate of rotation can be reliably extended back 500 years from 700 BC, uh, to be precise, I think 762 BC, to 1200 BC, or in this case about 1207. In modern astronomy, solar eclipses are categorized into three types, total, annular, and partial. In the ancient world, however, observers did not distinguish between total and annular solar eclipses, at least in their language. Uh, for example, Han, the Han and later Chinese records indiscriminately applied the same expression qi, total, to both total and annular eclipses. This is presumably because we knew which ones were total and which ones were annular, and uh, they used the same word for both. On the other hand, the Chinese records do have a separate word for a partial solar eclipse. Uh, Chin, and he has a reference for that, or they have a reference for that. It is only when we get to the eclipse of 28 July AD 873 observed in Nishapur, Iran, that we have an unambiguously explicit statement of annularity from Al-Biruni. So before that, you don't have records of annular eclipses. They're just described as total, at least according to these people. In a, total, in a total solar eclipse, the moon covers the disk of the sun with only an annulus of white light from the surrounding corona being visible. The level of illumination from which is roughly equivalent to that of a full moon. In an annular eclipse, the silhouette of the moon's disk is surrounded by a thin annulus of light from the uneclipsed sun, and the level of illumination on the earth is roughly equivalent to dusk. In early times, both were called total, and what was important was whether such eclipses <coughs> happened or not. At least to the people, uh, the ancient people as described by these people. To put our proposed ancient eclipse into context, we consider briefly the earliest recorded solar eclipses that have previously been suggested. Uh, so what he's going to do now is list all of the ones before 762, which is the Versagal uh, Syrian eclipse. Uh, a list of these is given by Espinac. He gives four possible recorded solar eclipses before 1000 BC. The path of a total or annular eclipse is narrow, so the likelihood of ancient re eclipse records occurring and surviving is small. It has to go over the people involved and it has to, uh, and they have to record it. His earliest suggested eclipse is attributed to two Chinese observer Ho and He. Legends say they were too drunk to see the eclipse and report it to the emperor, so he had them executed. 
Espinac has calculated a possible eclipse from the, for this time period and suggests it may have been an annular solar eclipse of 22 October 2137 BC. However, this well-known story is most probably apocryphal. So that's why you're getting rid of it. And Stephenson does not even mention it in his detailed survey of ancient eclipses, so we rule this out as being a reliable eclipse record. Stephenson doesn't mention it. They were too drunk to, to see the eclipse. Um, and it raises an interesting question as to wh why they pick on the 22nd of October for this particular one. But as they say, your mileage may vary. Uh, clay tablet. The next oldest eclipse listed by Espinac was dated originally to 3 May 1375 BC. And this one is recognized by Stephen Stephenson and was thought to be a total solar eclipse recorded on a clay tablet found at Ugarit in what is now Syria. However, a reanalysis gave a revised date of 5 March 1223 BC. Oops, wrong time of year. Well, maybe. Um, and so, not the right eclipse. Further analysis showed that the text on this tablet is best translated as during the six days of the new moon, the ritual of the new moon, of the month of Hiaru, the sunset, her gatekeeper being Reshep. Since this text does not seem to refer to an eclipse at all, the eclipse interpretation has been firmly rejected, uh, apparently by Pardi. Uh, twice, along with Swerdlow, once, and um, we therefore rule out this suggested record of an eclipse. Wrong date, can't be an eclipse, and doesn't really translate right. Keep that in mind. Those are the standards by which this guy is discarding everybody else's records. The subsequent solar eclipse on Espinac's list is dated 5 June 1302 BC. This refers to Chinese writings on animal bones which have been translated as three flames ate the sun and big stars were seen. That only happens during an eclipse, of course. Um, Stevenson has reanalyzed this eclipse in detail, stating that this translation is not widely accepted and uh, other Chinese scholars believe the text refers to the weather. In addition, he considers that the technique uh, Peng et al. used in revealing a date of around 1300 BC for the supposed eclipse is singularly unscientific and concludes that this supposed eclipse record is valueless for astronomical purposes. Notice how it's being judged. You see, what's happening is he's clearing the decks for his own. He's saying all these other people didn't see really eclipses. The only other eclipse record in the pre-1000 BC list of Espinac is a total solar eclipse dated 16 April 1178 BC, known as the Odyssey Eclipse, on account of a passage in Homer's Odyssey, probably written about in about 800 BC. Ghosts are going to Erebus beneath the dark. The sun has perished from the sky, and an evil mist hovers over all. Gainsford has made a detailed uh, assessment of this text and concludes that it cannot plausibly refer to an eclipse. He states, the passage refers to souls descending to Erebus, Hades, where notoriously the sun does not shine anyway. Again, Stevenson does not even mention this supposed eclipse in his survey of ancient eclipses. We therefore concur with Stevenson that until now there have been no reliable references to solar eclipses being observed before 1000 BC. Good. Now we're going to show you one that was. A possible observation. There is a possible reference to a solar eclipse in a puzzling passage in the biblical Old Testament book of Joshua. This records that after Joshua had led the people of Israel into Canaan, he prayed, Sun, stand still. Hebrew dome at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. 
The passage continues, and the sun stood still and the moon stopped. Hebrew, amad, stood. It's a standard word for stand in, uh, in Hebrew. Until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Joshua 10, 12 through 13. And that's from the New Revised Standard Version. The locations of Gibeon and the Valley of Ajalon are shown in figure one. And if you're wondering what figure one is, that is figure one, uh, except for the top, which is for what it's worth figure four. We'll come to that later. And that simply shows what an annular eclipse will look at at three minute intervals. And in case you're wondering, this line here is the horizon. Um, that's modified from there, figure four. Uh, turned it, basically uh, angled it for you so that it, it's easier to follow. Um, but there's, you start with Gilgal, you go to Gibeon, you go to Lower Beth Horon and Upper Beth Horon, and then Ajalon, and then Azica, and then finally Makeda. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is about five miles here, so we're looking, what, 20 miles, something like that, from Gilgal to Gibeon. Rough territory, no roads. You get to hoof it over the countryside. Um, same way, Gibeon to Lower Beth Horon is another, about six, eight miles, another couple miles here, another couple miles here, and another couple miles, uh, another, what, five miles there, 10 miles as the crow flies, maybe 15. This is rough territory and you're gonna be going up and down over hills, 15 miles. And then finally to Makeda. Keep those distances somewhat in mind as we continue. If these words are describing a real observation, so he's, he's coming down on the side that, 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 yeah, that this is not just made out of whole cloth, then a major astronomical event was being reported. There's been no day like it before or since. And presumably from people who had seen or heard of eclipses before. But what does the text mean? The Hebrew word dome means to be silent, dumb, or still. So it can mean stand still. And if you go over dome, you'll find out that that's one of the, one of the meanings. It can also mean be silent. Um, the term amad is a broader word meaning to stop or stand, primarily meaning to stand. It's the word you normally learn for stand if you're, if you're uh, learning Hebrew. Uh, modern English translations of this passage, such as the NRSV quoted above, have all followed the King James authorized version of the Bible, translated in 1611. I wonder why? Maybe because it makes the most sense and assumed that the Hebrew text meant that the sun and moon stopped moving. However, a plausible alternative meaning is that the sun and moon stopped doing what they normally do, they stopped shining. In other words, the text is referring to a solar eclipse when the sun stops shining. How's that for jumping fast? As a solar eclipse can only occur when the moon is directly between the earth and the sun, the moon itself is not visible, and so it is not reflecting sunlight to the earth. Like the sun, it has stopped shining as well. The first person to suggest that Joshua 10, 12 through 14 was referring to a solar eclipse seems to have been the linguist Robert Wilson, who almost 100 years ago gave the following translation. Be eclipsed, O sun, in Gibeon, and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun was eclipsed and the moon turned back. I'm not sure why you refer to the moon at the same time. While the nation was avenged on its enemies. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but wasn't the whole idea that they needed daylight? Uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> Stop asking impertinent questions. 
Um, Wilson claimed that in Babylonian cuneiform texts, there are words with the same root as the Hebrew dome that are used in Babylonian astronomical tablets in connection with eclipses, meaning to be dark. So maybe the word dome is kind of related to eclipse, maybe. However, at that time, 100 years ago, it was not deemed possible to investigate this further because of the laborious nature of the calculations required. Of course, it's a lot easier now with computers to do all our work for us. Um, if the solar eclipse interpretation of this passage in Joshua is correct, then the text describes it as having been seen by the Israelites in Gibeon in Canaan. Independent Egyptian in, uh, evidence that the Israelites were in Canaan, not that they had seen an eclipse, but that they were in Canaan at least, comes from the Merneptah steel, a large inscribed granite block now housed in the Egyptian mu Museum in Cairo. The Egyptian pharaoh Merneptah was the son of the well-known Ramesses the Great, Ramesses the Second. The inscription on the steel says it was carved in the fifth year of the reign of Merneptah, and mentions a campaign in Canaan in which he defeated the people of Israel. So the Israelites must have been in Canaan by Merneptah's fifth year. This, by the way, means that you can't say that, that the Israelites were never in Canaan. Um, at least if you do, you make Merneptah a liar, which may be true as well, but that's a different issue. Uh, the dates agreed by mainstream Egyptologists for the reign of Ramesses II are around 1279 to 1213, with his son Merneptah reigning from about 1213 to 1203, and uh, there's references. These dates are subject to some uncertainty, with the latest possible dates for Ramesses II being 1270 to 1204, and for Merneptah 1204 to 1194. Um, the fifth year of Merneptah was therefore probably 1209 to 1208, with the latest possible date being 1200 to 1199. So there's a little play in the uh, chronology, and uh, maybe if we get this eclipse lined up, we can firm up that. Uh, some other researchers, most notably including Roll. 1995. This I find fascinating because uh, most of the time when I see these kinds of articles, they don't mention the uh, new chronology. Uh, they, anyway, those researchers have proposed an alternative chronology for ancient Egypt in which these dates are advanced by several hundred years. So maybe there's more play than we realize. Their new chronology has achieved widespread publicity, I guess that's why you have to mention it now, alongside widespread criticism from mainstream Egyptologists. 50,000 Egyptologists can't be wrong. In this new chronology, the fifth year of Merneptah is 867 BC. So it wouldn't fit. Sawyer so followed up the suggestion of Wilson that Joshua 10, 12 through 14 refers to a solar eclipse and consider the dates of all total solar eclipses visible from Gibeon between 1500 and 1050 BC, but not the annular ones, giving generous limits to the possible dates of the entry of Joshua into Canaan. He finds that there were only two such eclipses on 19 August 1157 BC and on 30 September 1131 BC. However, both these dates are significantly later than the latest possible date for Joshua to have entered Canaan, uh, considered as the latest possible date for the fifth year of Merneptah. Historians and biblical scholars have therefore to date ruled out a solar eclipse interpretation of Joshua 10, 12 through 14. That doesn't happen at the right time. Okay. Sawyer followed up the suggestion of Wilson that Joshua 10, 12 through 14 refers to solar eclipse and consider the dates of all total solar eclipses visible from Gibeon between 1500 and 1050, again, the same spread. Um, 
he finds that there are only two such eclipses on 19 August uh, 1157 and on 30 September 1131. However, both of these dates are significantly later than the latest possible date for Joshua to have entered Canaan, considered as the latest possible date for the fifth year of Merneptah, 1200 to 1199. In other words, Merneptah is stuck in time, well, except for Roll and his people, and therefore the eclipse has to be before Merneptah. Historians and biblical scholars have therefore to date ruled out that scholar eclipse. So, in investigating the visibility of eclipses for this period, we have used our own eclipse code, which conforms to the IAU 2006 recommendations. The code uses our own fit of the French, um, won't bother reading all of that stuff, um, semi-analytical ephemerides to the JPL DE406 long-term integration. So they've taken a fairly standard uh, uh, projection and then they've added a little bit of a twist from the French to it. This fit required not only the adjustment of the secular terms to conform to the underlying basis of the JPL integration but also the addition of a number of higher order per perturbation terms that were omitted from the French lunar ephemeris. Hmm. Sort of like you know, if it doesn't quite fit, you add an epicycle. Um, maybe two or three epicycles to get it to fit better. Thus, to all intents and purposes, our calculations may be said to have effectively used DE406 <coughs> with minor modifications. To facilitate the calculations, we adopted the latest solution for the historical variations in the Earth's rotation. From our calculations, we find that the only annular eclipse visible from Gibeon between 1500 and 1050, in other words, we've already done the totals and they don't work, um, using the same generous estimates, was on 30 October 1207 BC in the afternoon. So there's an annular eclipse there where the sun doesn't quite get blocked out by the moon because the moon is a little too small because the moon is further away from the earth relative to the sun being further away from the earth. Um, and usually it's the moon that makes the biggest difference. Um, in the afternoon, ah, perfect, the afternoon. Our calculated track of the annular eclipse of 30 October 1207 BC is shown in figure two this eclipse tr passed directly over the land of Canaan. And uh, there's the pathway of the eclipse using their data. And that little circle there is Azica, and Gibeon is going to be about there. So it uh, does give you some idea of, uh, of what the expected path is. At this point, of course, the shadow of the moon lifts off of the earth. Uh, solar eclipse of 1207 BC, according to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, after an all-night march from Gilgal, the Israelites attacked the Amorites at Gibeon. They then pursued them to Azekah and then to Makeda. We have evidence from the historical geography of where these places were. Gibeon was about 10 kilometers northwest of Jerusalem, Azekah about 30 kilometers southwest of Gibeon, and Makeda about 20 kilometers south, kind of southwest of Azekah. Yeah, pretty much south. Because the eclipse occurred in the afternoon, it was probably seen from near Azekah where the partial eclipse would have started at 1527, 327 for those of you who don't do 24 hour time, um, local apparent time as given by the sundial. This wouldn't be the time zone time, this would be the actual sun time. Um, with annularity occurring between 1648 and 1653. The sun would still have been partially eclipsed at sunset, which occurred at 1738 coming out but not completely out. During annularity, 86% of the solar disk's area was covered by the moon. 
An interesting feature of the Joshua text is the observation that it stated that not only did the sun stop shining, but that the moon also stopped shining. Well, shining is supplied here. Um, as the moon is in conjunction at the time of a solar eclipse, it is effectively absent from the sky for a couple of days. Why would you need to specify that the moon stopped shining? It would be automatic. That's an interesting question. We'll come to that. As the Israelites used an observationally based lunar calendar, they would have been well aware of the monthly period of lunar invisibility and so could have timed their surprise nighttime attack at Gibeon to take advantage of the lack of natural nighttime illumination at this time. What's wrong with this picture? Why did they make the nighttime a surprise attack? Well, we'll, we'll look at the actual uh, account. After reporting that the sun stopped <coughs> shining, the book of Joshua states further that the sun did not hurry to set for about a whole day, Joshua 10, 13, which has given rise to the term Joshua's long day. What did the writer mean? Well, it sounds like it was pretty plain. But figure three shows the level of illumination on the ground at Azekah during the annular eclipse, and figure four shows the appearance of the sun as viewed from Azekah at three minute intervals. So you can see the faint image of the annular eclipse across the top there. So that's figure four. And here's figure three, which shows that the sun actually decreased in luminosity um, and then reached a sort of a plateau, but of course as it's setting, it's becoming less luminous just because of that, had a slight recovery and then continued to go down again. All ancient civilizations would have been accustomed to the sun going down in the afternoon. Most of us uh, also are accustomed to that, leading to daylight turning into dusk and then turning into night. However, on this occasion, in the afternoon, the light from the sun on Canaan started decreasing from its normal level at about 1530, until at about 1650, it was approximately 10 times less intense than normal, and dusk set in. Notice that in figure three, that figure three is plotted on a logarithmic scale to match the approximate response of the human visual system. However, by around uh, 1710, the level of illumination would have been somewhat restored before dusk fell again, and then the sun finally set at about 1738. In pre-scientific culture, such an unexpected deviation from normal behavior in part of the sun could only inspire awe, and the perceived change in the ambient light level would naturally lend itself to description in terms of the normal order of things, namely dusk. So the sun uh, is going down. It's what the Israelites would have witnessed was a double dusk. So they got two, two days in one. To the awe-inspired Israelites of 1207 BC, the amazing spectacle in the sky would have appeared to be long and drawn out. The reaction to such events tended to be, tends to be exaggerated, particularly with regard to perceived duration. For example, the solar eclipse of 18 July AD 1860 was observed in Sudan by Mahu Bey, who reported to everyone the two minutes of the eclipse were like two hours. Several people whom I questioned after the eclipse regarding the duration of totality replied that it had lasted for two hours. That's um, reference way back in 1860. Uh, so, you know, it was felt like two hours, or maybe it felt like a day. In attempting to describe this double disc, it is only natural that the Israelites would have done so in terms of their normal experience of the diurnal cycle. Although aware that on this occasion the time interval between the two discs was less than the normal day, the book of Joshua records about a whole day uh, for this period of time. In fact, the Hebrew text is here, like a whole day, the preposition like also means as, and so the phrase can mean as on a whole day. Well, like and as are not that much different in English for that matter. Um, and they actually talked to a biblical scholar for this. 
not only that, a um, what passes in um, in uh, archaeology for a conservative biblical scholar. Uh, Rainey and Kitchen are are evangelical Christians, among other things. Um, thus, the analogy being employed is one of one of following the diurnal rise and fall of the ground illumination. So it just seemed like a long time. The appearance of the annular eclipse on 30 October 1207 BC we are considering is shown in figure four. Both before and after annularity, the eclipse takes on the appearance of a crescent, mimicking the form of the moon around both the end and the beginning of a lunar month. This changing appearance of the sun may well have brought to mind the period of lunar invisibility at the changing of the lunar month when the moon stops shining. So the description in the book of Joshua of a celestial event in which both the sun and the moon stop shining is consistent with the observation by an ancient Israelite layman of an annular solar eclipse. Historical implications. Pre-telescopic eclipse records are of considerable chronological interest. The solar, total solar eclipse of 15 June 763 BC, for example, was recorded in Assyrian records and forms the basis for our being reasonably sure of when um, the Assyrian king list happened uh, to be placed in history. Uh, and is now used as a key fixed point to date Assyrian kings objectively over most of the surrounding three centuries. If our solar eclipse interpretation of Joshua chapter 10 is accepted, it has consequences for the chronology of the ancient world. As stated above, the Israelite, Israel steel of Merneptah refers to his confrontation with the people of Israel. The steel is dated to Merneptah's year five, which was the year of his most recent victory against the Libyans. This, the confrontation with Israel probably occurred in his year two to four, according to Kitchen. So 1207 BC is probably year two, three, or four of Merneptah. If accepted, this would conclusively rule out the new chronology of role. Well, that really stretches it there. And others for ancient Egyptian pharaohs. It also enables us to revise by a few years the mainstream Egyptian chronology. So we've got it close to right. They're way off. And I'm skipping over a few things. The Earth's rotation, and you can read that. At, at, and I'll even skip their conclusion because it's basically covered already. And the acknowledgments, the authors thank Alan Millard, Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Ancient Semitic Languages at the University of Liverpool for his help with understanding ancient texts. Now, we're gonna turn from there to the biblical record and I'm gonna just uh, uh, point out some chronological things that are kind of buried in the text. Um, Joshua 4.19, remember Joshua 1 and 2 and 3 are the crossing of uh, the Jordan at flood time. And then the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. So whatever time we're talking about, this is just before the Passover. And in fact, in Joshua, uh, 514 it states that they did keep the Passover shortly thereafter. Um, they also became circumcised shortly after this, and I, I don't know how long, but uh, Jericho is destroyed after a seven day, I don't know if you'd call it siege, but, um, um, and there are, by the way, r uh, broken walls of Jericho. They happen to agree with Roll's chronology better than they do with the standard one, but we will uh, let that pass. Um, uh, Joshua 7 talks about Achan. And the first attack on Ai and then Achan. Now, how much time is this all taking? I'm assuming that it didn't take a lot of time because um, there's references to Joshua after the first attack of, on Ai failed, being discouraged and feeling like uh, 
God is, uh, you know, the people around us are going to realize that we're not invincible and they're going to all attack us and we're in trouble. And then Joshua 8, Ai destroyed, and then the children of Israel went to Mount Ebal. Uh, in Mount Gerizim, apparently also, but uh, uh, specifically it records Mount Ebal. Now, the, the, the next question is, okay, so they destroy, it took one day apparently to destroy Ai, basically. Um, they went up to Mount Ebal, let's, I don't know, if you're in this environment, you really don't want to be sitting around for months at a time. So I assume that they went up and they completed their stuff within a week, but, you know, maybe a month. Um, Joshua 9, and it came to pass when all the kings were on this side of the Jordan and the hills and the valleys and all the coast of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hibite, and the Jebusite heard thereof that they gathered themselves together to fight it with Joshua and Israel with one accord. Well, this is kind of what you would expect. Jericho fell, AI fell. We've got to unite to, to knock these people out because they're not going to be knocked out without... Uh, how much time does that take? A week, a month? The story of the Gibeonites, of course, comes in Joshua 9. And the Gibeonites, you remember, they came down and they, how much time did it take for them to decide we want to go down there? Well, it's 20 miles, so let's supposing that they take uh, two or three days to get there. And it came to pass at the end of three days after they had made the uh, treaty that, that they heard that they were, uh, they were their neighbors and that they dwelt among them and the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities on the third day. So that's the normal, uh, you know, from Gilgal to, to, uh, uh, to Gibeon was the third day, you know, you start, you walk for uh, the rest of the second day. So you have at least one full day's travel and they got up there on the third day. So not very much time has taken place since the Gibeonites were uh, uh, made their treaty. And then in chapter 10, now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king. So he had done to Ai and her king and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, it's one of the royal cities. Now they've got extra people to fight with them and they know the territory too. And because it was greater than Ai and all the men thereof were mighty, we cannot let this stand. Therefore, wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, uh, the other kings there saying, Come to me and help me that we may smite Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of Amorites, king of Jerusalem, and so forth, gathered themselves together and went up, and they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. So, how long does that take? We're talking days, weeks, months. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up and help us quickly and save us and help us for all the kings of Amorites that dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not be a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. So they did an all night march. They covered 20 miles. They were moving. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekin and to Makeda. They'd been walking all night. They had gotten from Gilgal to Gibeon and then they kept right on going Uh, that's moving. Can you get that all done in a day? 
And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were going, the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven un, uh, upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died of hailstones, and they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Looks like um, great stones from heaven. Were they hailstones? Were they just regular old stones? Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the days when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, to, in the sight of Israel's son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. I want you to notice something very clearly. The sun is to stand in Gibeon. The moon is to stand in the valley of Ajalon. Are they lined up? And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people advanced themselves on the enemies. And then we have the first reference ever in any book that I know of. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? You don't believe me? You can go and look it up. So the sun stood still in the midst of the heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like it before or after it. Now I want you to notice, this wasn't Joshua that did this. That the Lord hearkened to the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So this is clearly not Joshua that did it. It's actually the Lord's long day that Joshua had the privilege of asking for. Now, in case you're wondering uh, that word, stand still, be still and know that I am God. Uh, there's a bunch of other texts that you can look up and uh, you can actually uh, look that kind of thing up online nowadays. And BLB Classic, under the, under the verb damam. Um, now, the way I see how this is being done, you first take and enlarge the story a little bit, and then uh, instead, of, instead of a long day, we have a solar eclipse. The next thing we do is we expand the story. Well, maybe it's not really a total eclipse, it's just an annular eclipse. And then you fit this into standard Egyptian history, and using that as a kind of a guide. And finally, you don't ask some difficult questions. How in the world did they get to Makeda in, uh, at the end of a 24-hour march? Because, you see, you start out at presumably close to dusk, gather up all your people, march all night, get up to Gibeon in the morning, surprise the uh, people who are presumably camped around the outside of Gibeon, defeat them, chase them, and then just keep chasing them for mile after mile after mile. To their credit, the authors contacted a conservative Christian for accuracy. I've got to say that. They also wrote it in BC and AD instead of the politically correct but, but irritating uh, BCE and CE. They also took the Bible seriously, not literally, but actually believed that there was something th worth looking at. And I you know, there are people who just assume that, well, the whole th story is all just made up. And they, they did something which we, in other areas, actually consider reasonable. They did a time-honored trick for explaining miracles. That is to say, if you remember, the crossing of the Jordan has often been attributed to a landslide, which was caused by an earthquake, which is not physically impossible. So, you know, to start out with, I'm going to say, you know, you, you have to kind of give them credit for, for doing something worthwhile. But there are events that will not fit with that kind of an explanation. And I'm going to start with Jesus' resurrection. <coughs> and I'm going to, of course, point out the res resurrection of Lazarus. By now, he's decaying. He stinks. The healing of the man born blind, which just will not fit with some kind of mechanical thing. Jesus had special salve for eyes. 
the Exodus itself, which is more to the point here, there's no, uh, well, maybe the wind blew really fast and the Sea of Reeds, come on guys. Uh, for that matter, Mount Sinai, uh, the manifestations there are supposed to be, well, maybe it was a volcanic eruption. Mm, the carved tin tablets, right, okay. And now, you see, the option of an actual miracle is not available to a materialist. Even a materialist with a Christian background. And so, they're not comfortable saying, well, God just did it. They're not even comfortable with saying, well, it just happened. And so, the eclipse is the only way you can make the sun sort of stand still. Now, uh, I'm going to criticize them with their own criticism. When one is making proposals, I think one must be critical of what's on proposals to the same degree as one is critical of opposing proposals. And if you take their criticism of the first three or four, the first four reported eclipses, I'm afraid that you have to say that this supposed eclipse record is valueless for astronomical purposes. Now, theologically, I'm going to say the story doesn't really fit either. The amazing thing was that God listened to the voice of a man. Eclipses have happened before and since. Even if you haven't seen one, you know about them. Joshua didn't cause the dark day, and he and those around him knew it. But he also wasn't just predicting an eclipse that everybody knew was coming anyway. This was so unusual that the author cited the first reference in any literature. This was a really astounding event. Now, what really happened to Joshua's long day? Well, maybe God wrote, uh, made a direct miracle. That's a possibility. Maybe there was some kind of cosmic disturbance of the kind that was proposed by Emanuel Velikovsky. Um, and you can go with the option that the story is not really reliable. But I would have to say that the annular eclipse story does not really solve the problem, at least the way I see it. Now, what, what, do, you, what do you do the next time you see something like this? Because they come out all the time, you know. And um, I think, number one, you need to do your own thinking. I, num I think, number two, you need to think beyond what is said to what is not said. And I think that you need to be careful when someone wants to wed a miraculous story to a mechanism. Especially if the wedding destroys the soul of the miraculous story. Because that's a forced wedding. It's putting a round peg in a square hole and shaving off everything that doesn't fit. I'm not sure that that's the way to make round pegs. Maybe round pegs should fit round holes. Um, and as I'm looking at this, I'm just thinking, marching all night, and then marching, defeating the enemy, and then saying sun stand still because it's starting to get, uh, looks like we're not gonna have time and then continuing all the way down to Makeda without any extra time, with everybody standing and wondering. Can you get from, from uh, Upper Beth Horon to Makeda in time uh, before the sun sets when the, when the sun uh, is eclipsing at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but that's my opinion, and now it's your turn. Yes. Um, you've raised a very important question here. Uh, how do you handle miracles and still claim to be a rational scientist? and science rejects them 
rejects miracles because, well, it's not rational. And then, of course, science runs into terrific problems when it does that, uh, like the fine-tuned universe, original life, and so on, and, and it goes into all kinds of machinations of trying to get work their way out of it uh, within a naturalistic interpretation. Uh, I personally don't see anything wrong with uh, both systems occurring. Uh, to me, the reality is that you have miracles, but they don't occur so often that rationality is, is aborted. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, if everything was a miracle, and if, you know, uh, every time we prayed for a person to live, we'd have eternal life and so on, and, uh, and we run into all kinds of problems. Uh, yeah, and then what do you do with the farmers who pray for rain and the, uh, and the people who pray for no rain so their picnic isn't spoiled? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> it depends on which side you're on, so where's your faith is going to go. So, uh, uh, to me, uh, we've got to recognize miracles do occur, but they don't occur so often that a reason doesn't work. And we know basically that science is worse most of the time, but they get themselves in trouble when they try and exclude miracles. Comment here. Yeah, I'm still wondering. Joshua needed more daylight and the Lord gave, them, gave him less daylight. Can, can you explain that part? Well, um, actually, I'm not the one that has to explain it, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, that I agree with you uh, that, that it, it makes little sense, and it makes even less sense back then than it does today because you're not, you don't have a nice road that you can walk on to Makeda. You've got to follow whatever trails they've got. And maybe some of them are fairly good, but we haven't got to the Roman roads yet, let alone the modern roads. I, I don't think you can get there in time. And I think it's easier to understand the story uh, from a common experience thing that there was a long day and that they had 24 hours to get down there than it is to say, well, they had three hours or maybe even five hours to get down there. I just, uh, what are we looking at? Uh, 30, 40 miles across country. Uh, how fast can you run? <laughs> it's just, I don't think you can get down. And, and they did get down there because they found the kings down there hiding in a cave. Uh, yes. Um, I'm thinking about the sun and the moon. <laughs> he, I know there are when as when the sun, a moon is waning, it appears in the s daylight, right? As well as the sun. And I'm just thinking maybe could that be an explanation? He's. It was a time of month where both the sun and the moon were appearing at the same time. That's what it looks like, and, and, it, and it looks like we're talking about the end of some month. Um, it, you know, if I try to put this into a chronological framework, I'm having them in the spring, and then somehow fitting six months into this whole time period, and it's really hard for me to see how, uh, because some of these events are in fact time. Joshua has uh, two days to get rid of AI. He has seven days to get rid of... Uh, uh, Jericho, he has three days to discover the Gibeon was actually on his side, kind of, uh, and then, and then the kings get to bring themselves up. I just don't see them waiting until October to do that. Um, yes. 
Uh, do we have the book of Jasher? No, we don't. Um, there are, there, there, there were books that claim to be the book of Jasher, but I don't think anybody really thinks they're what they claim to be. Um, I mean, it makes an inviting target to, if you're going to make up a book. I, oh, we found the long lost book of Jasher. Uh, comment back here. Thank you for the presentation. I, um, I, I'd like to speak in support of the author and this explanation. And I'd like to do it in the following fashion. The, um, the way in which time was, was um, measured had to do with the sun. Um, there were no clocks. You know, we're uh, four or five hundred years before the first water clocks that we know of, and certainly six or seven hundred years before the first mechanical clocks. So uh, a day was, was the time period between the time the sun came up and the time the sun went down. Therefore, the first day would have ended at dusk. And I'm guessing, but I think the Hebrew word there for dusk is probably erev. You would know that. Um. Yeah, Erev would be evening. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, it would in, it in, how much of it it would include. But at, at evening, the day was over. Right, right. So the, the first day would have been um, when the light dropped because of the, uh, the annual eclipse. And Erev would have signaled the, the, uh, the end of day one. Mm -hmm. Then when the light brightened again, um, it would have been the start of day two, and then that would have finished at the end. This would have been a very short day, I'll admit. Yeah. Um, but there would have been two days there, as they, uh, as they understood time. Because the, the notion of a 24-hour day, which we take for granted, was still 800 years in the future. Hipparchus, the Greek um, astronomer, mathematician, was, as far as we know, the first one to suggest that, that um, a day should be 24 hours of 60 minutes each. At this time in history, uh, the days would have been, the hours would have been one twelfth of whatever the daylight was. Right, and, and the hours would have been a little shorter in the winter than they yeah. are in the summer. Yeah, and they, they were quite used to having short hours in the winter and long hours in the summer. So uh, to have a day finish um, abruptly <laughs> at four in the afternoon, would just have been sort of like putting a, um, a winter day in the middle of whenever it was, because you would have divided that day into 12 hours, just like you divided all days. Because right. the sun was the only way you had to tell time. So if it was, in fact, I, I think this is an ingenious, if it was, in fact, a Erev that came up, that, that occurred that at 4.30 in the afternoon, then that would have been the end of day one and the, the, the uh, dawn or the coming of the brighter light. They couldn't see the, the annular eclipse. I, um, we've all had the experience just recently of looking at an eclipse. And you can't, uh, you can't look directly at the sun and see anything. All you do is get a hole in your retina. So they would not have known anything other than that it got dark it, and, and evening came. So um, I think it's, um, it, it's uh, admittedly, there's, there's a <laughs> few loose ends that need tying up. But we're dealing here with a story that was written many hundreds of years after the events. Well, we know that from the phrase, there's been no day like it before or since. And in all likelihood, the story would have been written in, I don't know, after the monarchy when, when Israel turned literary. So that would have been maybe 300 years later. Well, think about us trying to tell a story of some event that we didn't understand 300 years ago. That's the situation in which the author found himself. So I think it's, I think it's, um, it's, got, it's got potential. Well, I agree that as long as you don't ask too many questions, 
It does. I'm just, I don't, I have a hard time seeing how you get all the way from Beth Horon or Gibeah or, or even Azica all the way down in two hours. Uh, that's, you know, that's world-class marathon time. It is, it is, but remember, we're telling a story that had happened 300 years earlier, and um, I, I've stood on the mound of Jericho and listened to Larry Garrity say definitively that we haven't found the city of the time that Joshua conquered it. It looks like the, the city was destroyed at that point in time. And um, both he and Siegfried Horn, the dean of the Adventist Seminary, spent many years excavating the um, Heshbon, the, uh, the Moabite city. And it didn't exist at the time of this. So, um. you, so you've either got to change the, the whole, it, it, it died out, uh, I'm sorry. Um, when they dug the, dug the city, they ended up in iron, one, and there was nothing below that which meant that there would not have been a city there in 1200 BCE. And I've never heard anyone actually explain to me why then does Joshua say that the city was conquered on the way into the Holy Land? Um, there is the possibility because there, there is early bronze for material there. At Heshbon? No, no, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Jericho. Oh, yeah. No, then, then Jer Jericho had existed for, for a long time before that. But the three cities, Heshbon, Jericho, and Ai, were the first three that Joshua conquered on the way in. Mm. <coughs> I think that there's one more in there uh, with uh, okay. all King of Bashan, but, uh, uh, but, but I, I agree with you that there was three of the first four. Um, <clears throat> Two points. I don't think that just because we have a na natural explanation, solar eclipse, in any way diminishes the miracle that is described in the book Joshua. So I don't think that's a problem. The second, in your reading of Joshua, and I was just rereading it on my phone here a minute ago, I'm not convinced that the book clearly says they made this whole journey in one day. Uh, I'm, I mean, that's not... I think we're stretching what the book actually says to conclude that this all, clear to Macada was only in one day or 24 hours. So it could have been longer. You mean uh, so the distance you mean that doesn't there was bother. There a battle and then they yeah. and they camped for the night and then they kept on going. It doesn't really say or specify that. So you're reading into it. Uh, the, the distance, in other words, shouldn't concern us so much. Yeah. Yeah, I have a slightly less important comment to make about the distance. But I, every time you mentioned it, I kept thinking of Harold the Wake, 1066. He was in York, defeated the Vikings who came over in herds of masses, and then had his men march down to Hastings. 200 miles non-stop. They did not stop even for the night. Now, obviously, the horsemen were having a great time, but the troopers, actually people on their feet. And, you know, the outcome is very sad. It might have been different if he hadn't been so exhausted. But the point, anyway, is 200 miles from York to Hastings in 1066, not well-fed troops, very exhausted, but they did it. Now, these guys have been practicing for 40 years through very hostile desert terrain. They knew how to march. I remember as a 14-year-old doing 23 miles in a day, and for the last seven miles carrying uh, over 45 pounds on my back. Now, if I can do that as a teenager, these guys were fighting for their lives. They've been practicing for 40 years marching through the desert. The marching is not so great. But even then, you don't march 200 miles or, or that distance in a 24-hour period. And the only uh, total eclipse I've ever experienced was many decades ago. And you were able to march in that eclipse. It was light enough to be able to see what you were doing. It didn't become a night. Yeah. I, too, would speak to the, 
the hours, the time it took. As a 17-year-old smoker, I accepted the challenge of running up and down Pikes Peak for the first Pikes Peak Marathon. I'm not going to tell you how many short hours that I did, but the, the, the people who won the race were doing it in slightly over three hours, and marathons today are run at that speed. And again, these were hardened soldiers, and they didn't have carts or, or automobiles. They walked their whole lives. These people were probably more fit than we are. I was just um, wanted to comment a little bit on time. Um, there, you're saying that there's no clocks back then. Of course, the solar system is a clock. It it does run through time, and as far as story goes, uh, stories I don't think should be judged by how much technical knowledge they have. Should be judged by. Um, their humanity. We can relate to them because we're human. They, we, we assume that they're human also. Um, as far as watching the daytime go by, I don't see how anybody could, could count the day just from a solar eclipse to break it up, except maybe in prophecy. But when people watch the, the day go by, they look at the position of the sun. And whether it's annual or a full eclipse or whatever, they can tell the difference. That there's some, there's some event happening. And I, I just think that this idea is a little bit out for me. But. There's one other thing I think that deserves to be mentioned. The sun is to stand still on Gibeon. The moon is to stand still on Agilon. In a solar eclipse, they need to line up. <laughs> this is not going to work. Um, you know, as you said, there are some loose ends. Uh, yes, and it, did you, have you commented yet? Okay. I, I guess as a, <clears throat> as a student of physiology and behavior, I don't see an eclipse solving the physical demands of a long migration in two hours. They certainly would have had to have recognized that if this was a day, they didn't get very far in that day. Yeah. Mm, I, I have a little bit of a problem with uh, dating of the writing uh, simply based on the comment that there was no such day before or since as having happened, uh, meaning that the author came much later um, the reason is quite simple. I mean, in our Bibles today, we have all kinds of comments in the margins and various footnotes and such. We do not immediately jump to the conclusion that the original authors also put the footnotes and references and such. Why? A comment like that has to be of the same age as the original story. I do not see the logic behind that. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how an eclipse would be equivalent to the sun standing still, not moving. Now, of course, if the uh, if, this, if we are not uh, reading the Bible literally, then you have to explain it some other way. But uh, I have something else, a question. There's another story during the life of Ezekiah, the king of Israel. You remember that, uh, in other words, he asked for a longer life. And the Lord says, uh, 
what kind of miracle do you want me to perform for you uh, uh, to assure you that you will live another 15 years? He says, well, it's easy if the sun advances, but if the sun goes back, that would be a really miracle. How do you explain that? Is that related to this story or not? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that it's related directly in the sense of uh, you can tie the narratives together. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe somebody who studied that more could uh, tell you that the verbiage is the same or something like that. But uh, certainly conceptually, <coughs> I think you're dealing with the same kind of problem. And the interesting thing of it is in that particular case, the story is being told that uh, they observed something in Babylon that made them think that they wanted to come to Hezekiah. And presumably that was that they, meant they, they saw the uh, sun go back on the sundial as well and started asking why and heard that it had something to do with Hezekiah. Uh, this, by the way, is about the same time, uh, certainly the same period of time, at which uh, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were uh, found to be dead men when they woke up. <laughs> Obviously not the dead men themselves, but uh, their, their compatriots and they decided to abandon the siege as far as we can tell and we can tell this because Sennacherib has this big wall uh, carving of, of the capture of Lachish well the, the next obvious city to go should be Jerusalem but it's not there on his uh, it's not there on his little list of things to do and he brags that he shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage in Jerusalem. But he didn't take the city, why not? Well, apparently something happened that made him abandon his plans. Um, and from the sound of it, it's something that happened that could be observed by anybody and was observed by somebody else. Um, maybe that would be uh, an interesting question for uh, another day. Uh, go and look at all of the celestial disturbances that are recorded in the Bible and try to figure out if there's any, uh, uh, if we can make some kind of sense out of them. Uh, but it sounds like the God of the Israelites appears to have control over the rest of nature, not just uh, our human psyches. And maybe that's the point that's trying to be made, and maybe that's an uncomfortable point for us who think that uh, materials got everything except for our brains. Yes, so and then we have a comment back there again. I was just gonna say, children don't have a problem with this story. It, it, they don't have a problem with creation. They don't have a problem with this story. And the Bible doesn't give us, there are passages in the Bible that give us a lot of detail, but we don't know what part of this story we don't know as it was written. Uh, no, I, I think your observation is correct, and also people who, who um, who view the power of God as unlimited don't seem to have much problem with it either. It's people who have a God that really can't go beyond, maybe not even our brains, but certainly not beyond our brains, that really have trouble. Um, and uh, let's see, there, and then we'll go back straight, okay? It's, it's kind of interesting, all of the different uh, things in the Bible, because there is some place, as I recall, where they did some type of watch, and there were something where they were watching, you know, the midnight and then the early morning, so they had some, some way of keeping track of time at night so that the watchman 
we change their watches or they change the, the watch tower watchmen changed at certain times and I, I have to look up where that reference was now I don't have it off the top of my head but there was some some place in the Bible where it talks about so there had some way of keeping track of at nighttime how long the watchman would stay on the tower before the next relief came well I think that's usually considered to be the the stars going by but um, I'm open to other comments. Um, first, a comment about the watches. There were three watches a night for, for, throughout most of the Old Testament. Um, apparently, the uh, night watchmen got unionized, and they didn't want to uh, uh, spend quite that much time. So there were four watches a night, as near as we can tell, in the New Testament. And um, although they couldn't tell they couldn't tell time in the middle of the night without the sun. They could certainly determine how long uh, a time had elapsed. And we think they probably did it with, um, with oil in their lamps. When your lamp burned up its oil, it was time to go get somebody else to take over. Uh, we have an interesting situation with Paul in that in new translations, the, um, the, the time is given at in the first watch in the in the manuscripts and recent translations have given it in time at night in hours 915 or something like that that's to help us understand what's being said but it's not what the text says the text right. describes it in terms of watches um, my uh, translation which is the NIV says the Sun stopped in the middle of the sky and they, they translated that as stop shining. Right. And delayed going down about a full day. Well, if the day was, was measured from sun up to dusk, then in fact the sun would have delayed going down about a full day. And maybe that was the best way they could explain it because they obviously didn't know about the causes of eclipses. They, they thought the earth yeah. was stationary and the sun went round it. And that would have been true for a thousand years after them. Yeah, and I think that you even see a, a picture. For 2,000 years. We've yeah. only known that, 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 that the Earth goes around the sun for about 400 years. Yeah. But it's interesting that Joshua commands the sun to stand still on Gibeon, and then the moon to stand still on Agilon, which from our modern perspective would be most easily done by simply stopping the Earth's yeah, rotation. Yeah, stopping the Earth's rotation. Well, if you're, you've got a story here about something they did not understand that marked a significant event in their successful conquering of, of, of the Holy Land uh, or Palestine or whatever, <laughs> Canaan, I guess it would have been at the time. Anyway, the, uh, yes, they, they could tell the passage of time at night, but they couldn't tell time. You can tell time if you don't have a watch or a clock. You can only tell time in the day by looking to see where the sun is. Right. Um, well, later at, night, on, at night you can also tell time by looking at the stars. If, yes, but as far as we know, um, the, uh, we don't, there's no evidence in the Bible that they told time that way. The evidence is from um, astronomical records of Assyria and, and uh, Babylonia. As far as w any reference to time at night, it's always in terms of watches, the yeah. night watch. Yeah. Well, they didn't have any reason to subdivide it any further than that. No, that was, that was sufficient. Yeah. Yes? There is something else. We can always rely on the history. We haven't been at there at that time to observe. Even though for Lazarus' resurrection or Jesus' resurrection. But there were people who, who were the witnesses at that time. So that's a history we can rely on on them, and it's a fact, and we can trust and believe in that. I think there's an interesting point that is made by Emanuel Velikovsky, which doesn't mean that I agree with everything he has to say, but, but uh, he points out that there are legends from about 1400 BC in a number of different cultures that suggest that there was either a long night or a long morning or a long evening and again if you're if you the, the lazy man's way to do this is to stop the earth's rotation it looks like 
um, it looks like there may have been other witnesses to the effect in question. Um, and I think that that would kind of make it a little difficult to fit it into the, uh, uh, to fit it into the eclipse story. I think at the end of the day, you're going to have to look at all of the evidence. You're going to have to say which way does it fit best. But one of the things that uh, a modern materialist mind does is say, and there are certain explanations we just won't accept. One of them being that the that the sun actually or uh, the sun actually stopped, or to be from our perspective now, the mo the Earth actually stopped rotating. That just can't happen, and so then you are left with the eclipse theory. And now we've got one that kind of, sort of fits, maybe, if you don't look too hard at it. And so it's not much, but it's the best they've got. Well, you know, I guess I won't knock it too hard. Um, I personally find it easier to say that a god not only controls uh, the insides of people's hearts when they want him to. But he also controls physical reality. And this is the point at which, at which I think quantum physics may be able to teach us something. The real world isn't as real as you think it is. Um, comment down here and then I think we'll probably close it up. Um, two questions. One, the eclipse here is supposed to be in 1207. Um, how close of, or how much of a stretch is it from what we would conventionally consider to be Joshua's time frame for this? To, to try to shoehorn that that into there, the uh, more conservative interpretation of the Bible would put uh, the conquest at about 1405 plus or minus five years. Um, okay. So a couple hundred years is a. So we're we're off by a couple hundred years. You'll notice that they when they did the stuff they went all the way to 1500. That's to con encompass a conservative uh, approach to chronology. One of the things I'm suggesting, if you go to the conservative approach in chronology, we're actually looking at uh, a conservative approach to science as well as history. And that uh, it's not going to make a lot of sense to people who, who need to have everything fit into a conventional history and a conventional uh, science that adheres to materialism. A second part of the question is looking at it kind of backwards and assuming that that explanation is something that would work, I would wonder is, okay, if I saw an annular eclipse rather than a total eclipse, because I saw the total eclipse, you know, just recently and I, you know, before I've seen a partial eclipse, would an annular eclipse provide, you know, if, if I was going to write down, if I was going to write the story of Joshua and, and I was using an annual eclipse as the, the thing that I was observing, would I write it down that way? And I don't think I would because I'm not sure that it would be dark enough because even watching that total eclipse, I mean, we were in Salem, so we were, you know, right there in the middle of it. Until the moon completely covers the sun, it's still light. I mean, it just takes that little sliver, and it's still pretty light. I mean, it's darker, and you can tell that it's a little weird, and you know, the birds are doing their thing a little weird, but it's not anything the same until that disappears. And then as soon as it comes back, you know, there's a, there's a big difference there. So if I only saw something where there was still, you know, the main disk of the sun shining through, I don't know that I would write it down that the sun stood still or, or that the day extended. Well, with that, I think we will leave it. Uh, 
Next week we'll talk about your inner Neanderthal. <laughs>